Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihin kareem. So today we start the second uh, part of our business and Islamic finance class. Today what we're going to be covering is what goes behind or what you need to do before you even start a business. Um, and then the process of starting a business, all the research, development, so on and so forth. Um, last week, what we covered, just to give everyone a recap, and refresh everyone's memory. Last week, we went over business and its purposes. Um, we went over the two types of business, four ways to earn an income, and the four fundamentals of every business. So just to get into detail and make sure every uh, and refresh everyone's memory, uh, business and its purpose. It, this is where we as Muslims... Are you going to share? Uh, oh, on, on Zoom. Um, let's see. This is... Yeah, this is only just giving me whiteboard access. Let me see. Yeah. If you're a move share whiteboard, then it's just share screen beside of whiteboard you will share out. Let me, let me see. Yeah, yeah. Share with whiteboard Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, share screen for you. Yeah, so if you just. All right, wonderful. Okay, so uh, just to get into a little bit of detail of what we covered last week, uh, first and foremost, business and its purposes. So we went over the fact that business, the purpose of it is to earn a profit by delivering a product or a service. So basically, someone believes that what you're offering them, your product or your service, is worth them giving their money to you. It's an exchange. Uh, and its purpose, yes, profit is one of the purposes. But for Muslims, our ultimate purpose is that it has to be in line with our belief as Muslims that this is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that on the day of judgment, this will be something that we will be rewarded for. And this is what separates us from any other uh, economic worldview. Uh, you, you know, sometimes people say, it is, um, is Islam capitalistic or is it socialistic or is it co communist? Um, Islam has its own economic system in place. Um, it, it, there may be elements of capitalism, there may be elements of uh, socialism, there may be elements of communism, but at the end of the day, Islam's economic system is, it's a whole different thing. It, it's in its own category. So just like you have capitalism, uh, socialism, and any other economy, you have Islamic economics. Um, and that's, and at the heart of Islamic economics is that it is for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that it's every, uh, all our rulings, what's legal, what's not, is derived from the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then we get in, then we went over the two types of businesses. We said that there are actually there's three types. Uh, we said there's commodity-based businesses where you trade uh, or, or you sell an actual product. 
um, and there's a service-based business. And then there are businesses that are a combination of both. And then we went over four, four ways to earn an income. You can be an employee where you work for someone and you exchange your time for money. You could be self-employed where you own a job. You don't work for anyone. You work for yourself, but you're still exchanging time for money. And then you're a business owner where you have systems and people working for you. So at that point, you're no, lo you're no longer trading uh, uh, money for, I mean, for time for money, rather the money is being produced and the business is continuously running even in your absence. And then there's an investor. Investor is where they make their money work for them. And uh, one thing we highlighted last week was that a person can be in all four categories at the same time. A person can have a full-time job. They can have a part-time business. They can also be a business owner. Um, and they can also have investments in place. Uh, I knew a family, uh, both husband and wife, they were doctors. Um, but then they also had a business on the side. Uh, uh, they bought a franchise, uh, which was... Uh, an education franchise. So uh, what they would do is uh, uh, they would teach after school mathematics and whatnot. Um, so they had their full-time job as physicians or doctors, but then they, they, they ran a business and then whatever money they had, they invested it. So they were in three different categories. So it, it when we look at the four ways to earn an income, it's not, Hey, I'm just an employee or I have a job and that's it. You can be in multiple uh, uh, income categories at any given time. And then we went over the four fundamentals of every business. Four fundamentals are um, first and foremost, let's look over this over here. Four fundamentals are research and development, marketing and sales, fulfillment and delivery and operations. So at any given moment or not any given moment, these four things don't necessarily happen in sequence. So it's not that, you know, you do research and development and then after that you're done with it. And then you just focus on marketing and sales and then you stop marketing and sales and you focus on fulfillment and delivery. These four things continuously happen in, con in conjunction to one another. So any business you're going to see that they're always involved in research and development. They're always involved in marketing and sales. They're continuously fulfilling and delivering. They're continuously managing their operations on the back end. If any of these were to fall apart, and they're interconnected. So if one of them were to fall apart, the entire business would eventually start co collapsing, right? And one of the best examples we gave was of Nokia. Uh, just 10, 15 years ago, Nokia was the leading phone company, and they, I guess, failed with their research and development, and their marketing and sales started collapsing. And because there were no market, there were no uh, orders, there was nothing to deliver or fulfill, and in turn, their operations collapsed. So today, what we get into is now that we have a good idea or a clear idea of what the purpose of business is, what the foundation and uh, what the foundation of every single business is and the three types of business, maybe now a person is thinking, I want to get into business. I want to start a business. Where do I start? What do I do? Uh, how do I do it? And that's what we're going to briefly cover. Now, keep in mind that this is just a very generic overview. It is... Um, when starting a business, a starting a business is uh, uh, um, it, it requires a lot of front loading. Front loading means you have to put in eighty percent of your work up front, and then if you do it right, then the rest of the way, the twenty percent is just you know very smooth sailing for the most part. So when starting a business, there is a lot of time money and energy that is required. Um, a lot of research is required. But so what we're covering here today is not specific to any particular business. Uh, it's not going to go into all the details and the nuances. It's just going to give you a place to start. And then it's up to you to then take it from there. This is more of a roadmap. Uh, before we even get into, you know, where to start or how to start with a business, uh, I want to kind of go over 
who you need to be in order to succeed as a business owner, because not everyone, um, and this is, you know, just to be completely frank, not everyone is designed to be a business owner. Now, it's not to say that just because you don't have business experience or business knowledge that you cannot become a successful business owner, you definitely can. You need to build those characteristics. So we're going to go over those characteristics. So even before we discuss the what, we need to know the who. Because you can have a very nice system in place, but if you don't have if you do not become the type of person who can handle a business, the stress, the pressure, then that system is going to fail. Right? Say, for example, um, someone comes to you and says, Hey, or someone comes, uh, uh, comes, yeah, someone comes to you and says, Hey, I'm going to give you a multi million franchise. You have to do nothing but manage the franchise, you just have to manage the managers. So you have the what, you have the how, everything is in place. But let's say you are not the right person, that franchise is going to fail, right? So even before we can talk about the what and the how, we need to talk about the who, because everything depends on you, on whether or not your business is going to be successful, right? So businesses don't fail because the business is bad. Sometimes that is the case, right? Uh, but nine out of 10 times, it's because the person did not meet the standard that was needed in order to make that business successful. So that's what we're going to go over the who part. And this is why it's so, uh, uh, it's so important. So we kind of just listed a number of characteristics. Now there's a difference between a characteristic and a trait. A trait is uh, a, a trait is, let's say, something that is ingrained within you, and it's very difficult to change, right? Uh, whereas a characteristic is something that you can develop and you can enhance. So, for example, the first is intentional. Someone may not be naturally intentional. Some people are a little bit more detail-oriented than others, but with a little bit of practice, with a little bit of effort, a person can become intentional. So th this is what characteristics uh, are. So if, as we're going through this, if you're thinking to yourself or you're saying to yourself that, you know, I I'm, not a, the, I I'm not a person who's like this. And that's fine. The point is you can become a person like this. With, with enough time, with enough practice, you can become this person who has all these characteristics, right? So the point in case over here is that just because you're like you're you're a type of person today doesn't mean that's how you're going to be for the rest of your life. You can definitely change. And the best way to understand this is if you just look at yourself five, 10, 15 years from now and who you are now, you'll see that there's a big difference. You know, uh, when people try to get married, they it, it, they make a list of who they want their ideal spouse to be, this is who they need to be. Not realizing that 10 years from now, you're going to change and your spouse is going to change. You know, if you look back at your marriage, for people who are married, uh, you know, I'm married. I'm not the same person I was when I first got married. My wife is not the same person I married when I got married. So the point in case is that we are constantly changing, but we want to be intentional about who we become and who we turn into. So first and foremost is intentional. Um, and the way I've made this is I've given the characteristic name and then uh, I've given a description of the opposite of it, because sometimes understanding the opposite gives us a better idea of what it means to be that thing. So intentional is the opposite of doing things without a good reason, right? For example, you want to start a business, but it, it, it it's because your friends are pressuring you into doing it. It's because everyone else around you is doing it. You know, at one point, everyone was buying cryptocurrency. So you have no idea why you're doing it other than the fact that, oh, everyone's doing it. And apparently everyone's making money. So therefore you do it. But then when it becomes difficult, because you have no underlying reason, you back out of it, right? 
Um, so first and foremost is intentional. We need to know why we're doing something and what the reason behind it is, right? Uh, so, and the opposite of it is doing some doing things without a good reason. Anytime you do anything, if you're about to start a business, if you're about to uh, implement a specific tactic in your business or implement a specific strategy in your business, you need to know what is the reason or, or why I'm doing this. Not because everyone else is doing it, but how is it going to uh, uh, directly impact me? The next is responsible. This is the opposite of blaming others and finding scapegoats. So when a person is responsible, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the situations, they take ownership of their circumstances, right? If their business is failing and you're going to feel like that when you start a business, you know, um, uh, uh, um, I, I think uh, I forget who did, who did the study, but it, it was a very, very broad study. And the study concluded that almost 80% or almost 90% of small business owners fail within the first five years. Um, I know just alone in real estate, the turnover rate in real estate, you know, in order to become a real estate business owner, most of the time you need to become a real estate agent first and then transition from there. Um, the turnover rate for real estate business owners or real estate agents is 87% within the first five years or so. So, that's close. That that means only thirteen percent are making past the first five years. So, and it boils down to this over here: being responsible. That when you feel like your business is collapsing, when there's a lot of pressure on you, right? When you feel like the world is not being fair, your friend started the same business, or your cousin started the same business, and they're uh, experiencing massive success, but you're not. At that point, are you going to be responsible and say, what can I control and what can I do about it? Or at that point, are you going to say, life is not fair. The government's against me. This person is against me. You know, that person has it easy. So I'm just going to give up. Right. That is one of the biggest foundations of being successful in business. And I would say being successful in life in general, being able to, uh, able to take responsibility and ownership of your current position regardless of what's happening and saying that I'm going to try to do what's within my control and focus on that and not focus. Most people do it the other way around. Most people focus on what's beyond their control. Oh, the economy is bad. The government isn't helping me. You know, um, that person has it easy. Uh, my childhood, childhood was bad. My parents aren't rich, whatever the case. These are all things that are completely beyond our control, right? But they don't focus on what's in their control. How many more sales can I make today? What can I do to increase my knowledge? What can I do to partner up with someone? So we tend to focus on things that are beyond our control because casting a blame on someone else is so much easier than asking ourselves, what can I do today? Because it's gonna force us to do something that is uncomfortable and difficult. Uh, next thing is accountable. Um, Accountable is the opposite of doing the bare minimum. In other words, you have a high standard for yourself. And when someone calls you out, not only is it when someone calls you out, rather you seek out those opportunities where you can be held accountable. Um, the best business owners and the most successful business owners always have someone above them that is holding them accountable, constantly telling them that, I don't think your standards are high enough. I think you can fix that. I think you can fix this, right? Uh, let's try to improve that. So accountability is a big part. And the opposite of accountability is just doing the bare minimum or it's the opposite of just doing the bare minimum. It's never asking yourself, how can I get better? You know, let me bring an outsider and let them examine my business and give me tips on how I can improve because you're just happy with the bare minimum, right? Um, when it comes to business, the world is constantly changing and your business needs to constantly change and adapt in order to keep up. So you have to hold yourself accountable. You have to allow others to hold you accountable. Uh, the next is patience. Patience is a big thing. Um, it, it's the opposite of doing something once and giving up, right? Um, 
the most successful businesses, it's not that they're doing something that is radical or doing something uh, crazy innovative or anything of that sort. It's that they're doing the basics over and over and over again. They have the patience to do it. Uh, most business owners, they'll start very excited, but after the first one or two weeks, they'll give up because it gets boring. And that's where patience comes in. Patience requires you to do the, after all the motivation and excitement and happiness goes away, you just continue doing the same thing over and over and over again, right? Uh, take, for example, Apple. Apple is innovating, but behind the scenes, they're doing the same basic things over and over again. They're doing their research and development, whether or not it's boring. They can keep on doing it. They're doing their marketing, whether or not it's boring. They're doing their fulfillment, fulfillment, right? They're not basically, they're not jumping from one thing to another. They're not saying, oh, you know, uh, 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 we made cell phones. Now let's get into something else. They, they stick to what their original plan is and they continue through it. So patience. And then a part of patience is also being consistent. Um, next, we move on to being humble. This is the opposite of thinking you know everything and you are always right. Last week, when we went over the foundations of business, it's pretty straightforward, pretty easy. And quite honestly, you know, starting a business doesn't require you to have a PhD. You can start a successful business. Um, it, it, uh, you guys know the uh, yogurt company Chobani. All right. Do you guys know who owns Chobani? He is a uh, Turkish immigrant, uh, actually Turkish refugee. Uh, his name is Hamdi something. Um, but he came to this country with as a refugee, uh, no money. I don't know what his background in education is, but he, he came with a lot of disadvantages. And now he owns a, I don't know, multi-million, billion dollar you know, company. But the point is, starting and starting a successful business is not difficult but then sometimes people get into it who don't come from a business background they may be very very well qualified in a certain field they may have very high credentials and they start a business and they say well i have very high credentials i i, I you know i have a phd or i'm an mba whatever the case how difficult can this be i don't need to get advice or help from anyone and that's where they start collapsing because having theoretical knowledge is not the same thing as having practical experience. So being humble is in business, being able to go to someone who has the success and you go to them and you say, can you teach me? Even though that person's credentials, that person may not be a PhD or whatever the case, right? It's having that humility of going to someone and asking for help, right? So that's uh, so humble is the opposite of thinking you know everything and you are always right. Um, next, and a big part of this is when you get criticism, instead of just dismissing that criticism, you actually look into it and you say, is it true or not? Is there some truth to this criticism? And if so, then you just got free advice. Uh, next is grateful. Opposite of thinking, everyone has it better than you. Um, you know, especially in this day and age of social media, you log into social media and everyone is sharing their wins and the successes and how amazing life is. Um, maybe 1% of the people are going to share uh, you know, some difficulty that they're going through in life. They're, maybe they're suffering, uh, maybe they're fighting cancer, or maybe, you know, um, one of their loved ones, uh, you know, uh, passed away. But other than that, you open up social media, most people, and the stuff that is getting the most amount of attention are people who are showing off all their material wealth. They're showing off how rich they are or how successful they are. And you look at that, and you begin to say to yourself, you know, that person has it so much easier than I do. You know, that person comes from a background of privilege. That person comes from a background of connections. And that may be true, right? That may be true. But just because that's true doesn't make life any different for you. You get what I mean? 
uh, it, you can't go up to someone and say, that person has it easy. So now you need to make it easy for me. Like it, it doesn't work like that. So being grateful, it means that you recognize what's in front of you, what you have to work with. And you're grateful for that. And you take full advantage of that because the reality is we all have some sort of advantage or privilege over the other person, right? Um, even if outwardly and apparently it may look like or feel like that I have no privilege or advantage, the reality is I have some sort of advantage or privilege over another person. And that person has some sort of slight advantage or slight privilege over myself, right? Um, and this privilege or advantage isn't always from a positive angle. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, a person who is in a very difficult financial position and they have to, uh, they have a lot of dependents. Maybe they have parents, maybe they have, uh, they, maybe they have elderly parents, maybe they have uh, children, a wife uh, uh, or a spouse that they have to support. The amount of pressure that person is in, that person's motivation is going to be this high. Why? Because failure is not an option. As opposed to a person who has no responsibilities, no bills, maybe they're living with their parents. Hey, if this doesn't work out, I'll try something else. Their level of motivation is down there. So this person outwardly may look like he's going through the worst time in his life, but his motivation is so high that he's going to figure it out or she's going to figure it out and they're going to succeed. So that's a privilege or that's some, uh, 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 that, that is an advantage that they have over someone else. So part of being grateful is being able to recognize the advantages and privileges that you have and not worry about how easy it is for everyone else. Not worry about, oh, that person is more successful than me. Not worry about, oh, that person has it easier than me. Uh, or, uh, you know, the statement, oh, it must be really nice. You know, uh, whenever everyone says that, it must be really nice uh, not realizing that the other person may have struggled a lot to get to where they are. Next is forgiveness or forgiving. This is the opposite of holding on to past mistakes. And this works two ways. Number one is being forgiving of yourself. Um, in, in part of business or part of learning is by making mistakes. We learn through making mistakes. The more mistakes we make, the faster we learn. So if you're not going to forgive yourself for making mistakes, you're not going to be able to progress. If you made one mistake and you let your past decide your future by saying, you know, I've made so many mistakes in the past. I'm so scared to now try something new. What if I make more mistakes? Well, from every mistake, you had an opportunity to learn what not to do, right? So you need to learn to forgive yourself and not let your past dictate your future. And the other aspect to this is being forgiving of other people. Hey, just because your business partner or just because this person made a mistake in the past doing something else doesn't mean you should not give them a second opportunity or a second chance. Next is decisiveness. Uh, this is the opposite of waiting around to take action. You need to make a decision. Instead of making that decision, you are now just you know, it, you don't know what to do. You don't know what to do and you just spend days, those days become weeks and then months and you still haven't made a decision. Um, what's interesting is making the wrong decision is better than making no decision at all. Any reason why? Why? Exactly, right. Yeah. If, if you make a decision and it's the wrong decision, now you know out of my 99 options, this one option is not the right option. I can move on. As, a, as opposed to a person who did not make a decision, that person still thinks that wrong decision may be a right decision for them, right? So a big part of this is being able to decide. Obviously, part, uh, this does not mean that we just haphazardly or randomly decide, but we take our time, we do our research, but we try to make that decision as quickly as possible. Um, and this brings us to the second thing, the next thing, which is being calculated. This is the opposite of making decisions without thinking it through, right? This is uh, uh, calculated means that we're, we need to make a decision. Let's do some research before just 
haphazardly jumping into it, right? Uh, you don't ever want to start a business without calculating your risks. How much is it going to cost me? What's the return? Or, or what are the potential dangers I'm going to face? So on and so forth. And next is optimistic. Uh, this is the opposite of believing nothing will ever work for you. If you are not optimistic, you should not start a business because you'll never be able to look past all the difficulties that go into building a successful business, right? Um, it, too many people get into business and it gets difficult and they say, this is never going to work, never going to work, never going to work. Not realizing that if they just continue doing the work, eventually it will start working. So optimism is a huge part of, uh, 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 of being a successful business owner. Just having good hopes that your business is going to succeed if you continue putting the work, right? Think about this. If you have a proven plan, you have a proven plan on how to become successful. But part of that plan is that the first 90 days, it's going to be very difficult and you're not going to see any results. If you have absolutely no optimism, no hope that this the, your efforts, your work is going to pay off, you're not going to want to do it, right? You're not going to want to make the phone call. You're not going to want to go and speak to that person, so on and so forth. And then last is considerate. This is the opposite of being self-centered, right? Um, when you run a business, as we said, you're, you're taking someone's money in exchange of giving them a product or a service. If you are not considerate and thinking about your customer, your client, your business partner, your employees, and all you think about is me, 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 and um, what my bottom dollar is going to be, then your business is going to collapse, right? So these are um, not, lim we're not limiting to this, but this is some of the most important entrepreneurial characteristics uh, that are needed in order to be successful. And what's very interesting is if you look at this, these are actually characteristics and descriptions of a Muslim, right? A Muslim is intentional. A Muslim is responsible. A Muslim is accountable. These are all, in one way or another, these characteristics are either highlighted in the Quran or in the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's, that, that's the beautiful part. If you can be, um, if you can develop the characteristic of a good Muslim, inshallah, you will be a successful business owner. All right, now we move on. Now we get into business planning models and tools. You want to start a business, where do you start from? Or how do you start? Um, yeah, does anyone have questions before we move on? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's that's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so no one has any questions? All right. So now we get into business models and tools. So before you start a business, you need to plan how you're going to make that business successful, right? This is the research and development stage of your business. Um, no one ever or no successful business owner just says that, I have an idea, let's start doing it, right? They think, think it through. They plan it. They calculate the risks involved. They determine the tactics and strategies needed. So 
the first and foremost place that we start from when starting a business is research and development. And part of research and development is creating a business plan of what you need to do moving forward. Um, so the first thing that I like to do uh, is what we call a brain dump. A brain dump is writing down everything that's on your mind. You may have this elaborate business idea, but until you write it down on paper, it's not going to become crystal clear to you, right? In your mind, it may seem like it's making sense. In your mind, it may seem like all the dots are connected, but until and unless you write it down, you're not going to crystallize it. Once you start writing it down, then you're going to start seeing the missing links. Oh, this doesn't connect to that. That doesn't connect to that. So first and foremost, write down everything that's on your mind related to this business, right? I want to start this type of business. This is what it's going to do. These are all the different services or these are all the different products, so on and so forth. You start by writing everything down. A part of this is also just getting in the habit of journaling. So journaling, which simply means writing down your experiences, your, uh, what you've learned, is a very effective tool for gaining clarity and insight, right? Because the way our, mind, our brains are programmed is that we just fill in the missing gaps. We make conclusions and assumptions. But then once we start putting our thoughts on paper, that's when we start seeing the missing links. You know, writing, uh, 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 someone once said this, it's very profound. Writing is the action of thinking, right? So when we're thinking, it's in our mind. But the physical action of thinking is actually writing down our thoughts. So one good habit to have is you have a journal dedicated to your particular business. Anytime you have ideas, anytime you, if something doesn't work or something does work, you write it down in that particular journal so that you can continuously come back to it and uh, you know revisit what you've wrote down. The next thing is, or the next piece of tool is what we, uh, what's called Eisenhower matrix. So an Eisenhower matrix is used to determine your priorities. You know, you have this great business plan, but you might, uh, you, you have this great business plan, but you're a little bit confused on where to start because everything seems like it's very important. Getting a, uh, getting a website up is very important. Creating an LLC is very important. You know, I have to talk to my CPA. That's very important. But what do you prioritize? Because we can't do everything all at once. <laughs> so the Eisenhower matrix will help us determine what is an immediate priority. And if you look at the uh, uh, graph over here, basically there are four quadrants. On, on, uh, on, on the side, you have important and not important. And then on the top, you have urgent and not urgent. So whatever falls under important and urgent, those are things that you need to start doing immediately, right? They could be things like uh, uh, with clear deadlines, or they could be things that you need to do right now in order to do the next thing, right? Um, then you have urgent, I mean, sorry, then you have important, but not urgent. So those are things that, they're important, but you can't do them until you do something else, right? So for example, uh, you meet up with your CPA and your CPA says, I can register your LLC, but I need the LLC name. So that's something that's urgent. You need to come up with an LLC name. And what's important, but not urgent is registering the LLC. Why? Because without the LLC name, you can't register the LLC. So in your Eisenhower matrix, you write down what's important and urgent is coming up with an LLC name. And then not urgent, but important nevertheless is creating an LLC. So we schedule that. So what's important and urgent, we try to do it immediately. What's important, but not urgent, we schedule it. We say, we're going to do it next week or three days from now, whatever the case. Then you're going to have certain things that are not important, but urgent, right? Uh, maybe uh, 
what's a good idea? Maybe uploading blog, blog posts, scheduling, responding to some emails, right? So these are things that are urgent, but not important. Are these things that we can hand off or delegate to someone else, right? Um, so that's not important and urgent. And then la the last category is not important and not urgent. Sometimes things come up that we think we need to do, but then when we put this together, we realize hey, it's not really important and it's not urgent. So just get it, get rid of it, right? Uh, maybe it's bugging you. I, I really need to check my Facebook, and you and you you put this together and you're like, wait, checking Facebook is not related or important to my business, and it's not urgent. So let's just not worry about it for now, right? Then from there we do. Uh, 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 um, we do what's called a SWOT analysis. So a SWOT analysis stands for SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And the purpose of a SWOT analysis is to you is used for finding new opportunities, right? It's used for finding new opportunities. You want to you can do SWOT analysis for yourself. You can do SWOT analysis for a business that you want to get into. For example, you want to start publishing newspapers, right? Let's just say you come up with this idea one day, or someone tells you, you know, you should really look into, um, no, I'll give you a better example. Uh, uh, say, for example, where we go back in time two years ago, COVID just started. One of your friends comes, comes up to you and says, hey, I have this brilliant plan. We're going to buy a uh, medical office and we're going to do COVID tests, right? And you say, wow, that's a brilliant plan. Everyone has COVID or everyone needs COVID tests. So we're going to make a lot of money. So now you do a SWOT analysis for that business. What are the strengths for that? The COVID testing business. Strength is that it's in high demand now. Strength is that people are willing to pay for it. Uh, uh, there's urgency required, right? Um, so what are the opportunities? Opportunities from is that we can, uh, you know, uh, 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 opportunity is that we're the only uh, COVID testing center in our area. Um, but what are the weaknesses? Weaknesses may be that two years from now, COVID may not be critical anymore. So our demand is going to go down. I'm giving this example because it really happened. So, uh, someone bought a business, uh, a medical office, just for the sake of doing COVID testing. And during you know the last two years, business was booming, but now they're like, we're hardly making any money because no one's coming in for, uh, the COVID test isn't in demand anymore, the way it was. So now they are uh, you know, at a loss. Now they're trying to uh, pivot their business. And what they're doing is looking into um, other forms of testing, like, you know, blood testing and stuff like that. But you can do a SWOT analysis for yourself and for the particular business that you want to get into. It's going to help you see what your strengths are, what the weaknesses are of that business, what are opportunities and what are threats. Go ahead. So if you did a SWOT analysis for, say, yourself, yeah. like in the strengths category, would that be like perceived strengths that are like yeah. things yeah. you do well, or like yeah, right. characteristics exactly. you have which are potentially useful? So, so um, um, that, that's, that's, that's a great, great question. question. So, so when, when we do SWOT, SWOT analysis, analysis for ourselves, ourselves what, what do we put, put in there? For strengths, for strengths you, want you want to put in there. there uh, like, uh, like you said, said perceived strengths, strengths and advantages, advantages and, uh, and, uh, and, and privileges, right? right. Um, um, so, so I'll, I'll, give, so I'll give, give you some ideas. ideas. Uh, uh, when I did a SWOT analysis, analysis for one, one of the uh, agents, agents on my team, what, what we put down for him were things, things like, like he's, he's very coachable. He's good over the phone. He's self-driven and motivated. He's, he's focused. focused. He doesn't get caught up with, with you know, like 10, 10 different, different things months. at once. He's, he's organized. organized. So, those so those are different strengths. strengths. Um, there's, there's a really, a really good book called Atomic Habits. Habits. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in that, that book, book, all the way towards the end, he, he, um, you know, uh, there's a chapter on how to find your passion or how to find out what you're good at. And one of the things he mentions is that 
it's, it's not, not always about finding, finding out what, what you're good at, good at but it's, it's about what you, what you can tolerate. tolerate. Not, not everyone is able to tolerate the same thing at the same level, level right? right? For, For example, example, teaching seven-year-olds, I can't tolerate it, yeah. right? But my wife can. So is it that she likes doing it? Maybe not, but she has a very, very high threshold. Whereas my threshold when it comes to seven year olds, it's very minimal. It's like, I can't do this, right? Um, so James Cleary says that, you know, to find your strengths or find your passion, look into what you have a high tolerance for. And you, you can excel in that, right? Because, you know, um, pleasure is something that will push you, but pain is something that will push you even harder. So if someone, um, it, is experiencing a lot of pain in a certain field or a job, they're going to want to quit and leave that and go to something else. But if you can tolerate that pain, then you can get really good at it. And eventually a time will come where that pain is decreasing and your pleasure levels, meaning your passion levels are uh, 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 much higher. So when it comes to a personal SWOT analysis, it, those are things you put down in your strengths. What are you good at? What are you able to tolerate? Um, and this is not necessarily a comparison of yourself to someone else, but rather, you know, what are you good at? Um, well, I know how to use Excel. Well, great. Uh, I know how to use a computer because a lot of people don't know how to use a computer. Um, I'm good at making phone calls and com communicating with people over the phone. Um, you'd be surprised. There are a lot of people who don't like to talk on the phone. Um, I'm really good with sending text messages. So all those, although these things are things that we take for granted, and that's the beauty of the SWOT analysis. It opens our eyes up to what we can leverage. And then weaknesses. Weaknesses are there to show us what we need to prepare for. So certain weaknesses could be that, you know, um, I'm unorganized. So that, that's actually one of the things I put down for my business, for my weakness, that I'm unorganized and um, I don't have much attention to detail. So I put that down as my weakness. So now I have two options. Either I can focus on that and try to make myself a little bit more organized or more attentive to detail, or I can hire an admin, mm -hmm. right? So that's why, you know, with sending out these emails and what I'm not good at it because I, uh, I'm unorganized, right? But we have an admin who takes care of all that stuff for us, right? So the part of weaknesses is to identify what you're lacking because you're always going to have weaknesses. And then either find someone who's really good at that or you need to find a system that can take care of it for you. Or if there's no other option, you need to make sure that gets done, right? Now, opportunities. Opportunities are uh, what is available to you right now. So, you know, one of the opportunities that we put, uh, that I put down for my own personal business is that, and sometimes, you know, you'll have a mix of both. Uh, your SWOT analysis will sometimes spill over to your business analysis, right? So when we were do when I was doing my SWOT analysis for myself and my business at the start of this year, one of the opportunities that I put in was that, I have the opportunity to expand my real estate business into central Jersey, right? Because I moved from the Voorhees area, which is like 40 minutes from here to Mount Holly. And now I'm much closer to central Jersey. So that opportunity when I was in Voorhees may have been there, but it wasn't practical. I wasn't willing to drive an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, you know, to get opportunities or deals in central Jersey. But now it's only half an hour away. So now it's much more practical. So that's an opportunity, right? Going back to um, my friend who started that COVID testing thing. One of the weaknesses is that, um, or not weaknesses, but that's more of a threat. One of the threat was that COVID testing was at a decrease, right? But then the opportunity now is that we can now focus on other lab testing. Right. So that's what we put down for opportunities. And threats are usually things that are a little bit out of our control, whether it's the economy, whether. Um, so we initially said that focus more on what's controllable and less on what's beyond your control. 
but that that doesn't mean that we never think about what's beyond our control. You know, if there is a war going on somewhere, if there is a uh, uh, if there's a recession, inflation, these are all things that are really beyond our control. Uh, like we cannot directly control these things, but we still want to be aware and cognizant of them so that we can make better business decisions. Well, if we're in a recession, then that means uh, we need to start cutting down our expenses and we need to save more money, right? Uh, it means that instead of now funding or dumping hundreds of thousands of dollars into a new research project, let's hold off on that. Let's keep that money in our reserves. And then once the economy gets better, then we can focus on that, right? So the SWOT analysis is there to really uncover uh, and give you clear cut ideas of how to take your business to the next level or what to do next, right? Any questions on this? Yeah. Can I just follow up on earlier? So, like, if you do a SWOT analysis for yourself as a person, yeah. Like, for the opportunity, then there's opportunities, I guess, like ways to improve the or like things that could be beneficial to you. So what would be like threats? What, what would be like what? Threats, like if you did a SWOT analysis for yourself as a So threat uh threats would be so weaknesses would be uh, so another way to look at this is strengths and weaknesses are what's in your control. Yes. Opportunities are, and threats are what's a little bit out of your control, right? Um, so threats in this case would be like we said, uh, a down market, a recession, um, inflation. Um, another um, threat could be that, you know, um, uh, uh, another threat, it could be that you just had a new child. So it's not a threat necessarily like in a negative sense, yeah. rather it's, uh, it's a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you going to do? Give the new baby away, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a threat because now you have to, there's more time going in there, right? So threats are kind of highlighting disadvantages that or perceived disadvantages that are beyond your control. And the reason I say perceived is because even threats, you can turn into opportunities, right? So that's that. Um, next, we move into, all right, so... The last few things, the brain dump, Eisenhower matrix, and the SWOT analysis was there to kind of just gather and organize our in, our all the information that we have. Um, so now how do we take that information and how do we actually put it into action? Uh, so people at the start of the year, most people will write down their goals, but they'll never write down the actions needed to achieve those goals. So they'll write down, I need to lose 50 pounds, but they'll never write down, what do I need to do to lose the 50 pounds, right? So likewise, you do all this, you may, you may have a really good business idea, you know your strengths and weaknesses, you know what you need to prioritize on, but you stop there and you don't write down, okay, what's my next immediate action step? So this is what we're going to focus on now. So we call this the 10 5 one. So 1051 is you start with your 10 year vision, you bring it down to your five year milestones, and then you set your one year targets. What does all this mean? Uh, or what's the purpose of this? The purpose of this is to help you align your short term goals with your long term goals. Or a better way to phrase it is this is to help you align your short term actions with your long term goals, right? So I'm going to rephrase this a little bit. This, this helps aligning your short-term actions with your long-term goals, right? So how do we do this? Um, the purpose of this is to reverse engineer where you want to get to, right? So if your vision for your company or your business 10 years from now is that you want a business that will allow you to work from anywhere, you want a business that allows you to step out of the business and the business will still continue to function on its own, it's a business in a particular industry, 
you write you write all that down. That's your ten year vision, right? Or even if you don't want to use uh, ten years, but that's your big vision, right? So how do we now bring it down? How do we go from ten years? Um, one second. How do we go from ten years to a uh, five years? So ten year vision is kind of you know it, it, it's kind of generic. It may not be very clear cut, but five years from now, what are the major milestones that we want to have in place, right? So if let's say we want to start a yogurt factory, right? Like Chobani, for example, 10 years from now, um, I want my yogurt company to have 10 plants throughout the USA, 10 manufacturing plants. I want to have, you know, a uh, hundred thousand employees. Um, I want to be the, um, and 10 years from now, I want to have sold that company for $5 billion, whatever the case, right? Let's just say these are my 10, this is my 10 year vision. So what are my five year milestones? If I want to get to there 10 years from now, then five years from now, what does halfway look like for us? Well, some milestones would be for sure. I have at least three or four factories. I have at least 30 to 40,000 employees. Um, my, uh, I've taken my business public. So it's on the public stock, uh, uh exchange. Um, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm the CEO of my business. So these are some milestones that I've created. Okay. Now I take that and I boil it down to this year in the next 12 months, what are the main targets that i have to have in place? Well, I have to have a good selling yogurt. I have to have a good selling product. I have to have at least one manufacturing plant, whether I own it or not. I have to have a few employees. So you see how the 10-year vision helped us reverse engineer where we need to start, right? It, we need to start with having a good yogurt product, right? You could do it the other way around. You could say, oh, I have this very good yogurt product and let's just run with it. That's good, but it's better when you reverse engineer because then you're able to set things up so that it aligns with your long-term plan, with your long-term vision, right? Same thing with like, let's say building a masjid. If you just say, I have this land here, I'm just gonna start building brick by brick without a long-term vision in mind. Like that's gonna be the parking area. This is where uh, you know the school is gonna be so on and so forth. Instead, you just say, let's start just putting down the bricks. Then although you're gonna have a building, but it's gonna be very unorganized, right? You, you, you get the point? So reverse engineering helps making sure that everything is aligned. Okay. Uh, then we get into uh, 90, 60, and 30. 90, 60, and 30 is exactly what we did with 10, 5, and 1, but more hyper-focused. So this helps you focus on immediate actions and steps. So we, what we spoke about before was 10-year vision, five-year milestones, one-year targets. Now we take that and bring it down and make focus on what our action steps 90 day what what do we want to accomplish in the next 90 days what do we want to accomplish in the next 60 days in the next 30 days right so th this th and this is what effective goal goal setting and planning looks like you set a goal and then you bring it down to what do i need to do today what do i need to do this week what do i need to do next month what do i need to do in the next two months what do i need to do in the next three months right um and that's what it is yeah. If you miss these targets, are you going to realign your... Absolutely. The uh, targets and goals are just there to give you some sort of pointer, right? 30 days from now, you may say, hey, you know, I kind of overestimated. Or 30 days from now, you may say, I underestimated. So now you, reach, you change that. So this is constantly changing right? Your goals and your targets are constantly changing. But the reason why we do it in small steps is because we don't know what's ahead of us. We don't know what kind of challenges we're going to face 10 years from now. We don't know what kind of challenges we're going to face 60 days from now or 30 days from now. So we start with 
what's right in front of us, and then we follow along the way. Uh, a good example of this is, let's say, you know, you're driving down a very, very dark road. Um, you have your GPS. Your GPS is kind of showing you where you go, but you can only see as far as your headlamps will allow you to see, right? Your GPS is telling you, you go straight. Your headlamps is showing you that the road is clear. But as you go, 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 you see a deer in your way. You see maybe there's a detour. You may, be, you may see there's an accident. Once you see that, then you readjust and you realign. So your 10-year vision, your five-year milestones, your one-year goals and targets, these are always going to continue changing, right? What you wrote down today, five years from now, you're going to have different goals, different priorities, right? But we bring it down because this is what our next immediate step is. We only know what's ahead of us once we get, get there. Does that make sense? Yeah, you're right. The same thing like when you... Any three or career goals, same. Yeah. If you want to be at a certain stage, then at a certain level, you progress accordingly. You take yeah. step steps. For example, start with a small job, then you take a supervisor. Exactly. Job, you the manager, director, you know, and you know that in 10 years you want to be a CIO of that company. Yeah. Then that's how you yep. progress and you take those steps. Even with building, let's say, building a masjid. You may have a certain architectural plan and you start building and you get, get through halfway and you realize that on paper, it seemed like a good idea, but in practice, it's not. And now you redesign the entire thing and then you start from there. So that's exactly how your business plan is, right? Your business plan is just to give you, point you in the right direction. But it doesn't mean that once you write it down, you can never change it. It's always going to change. And that's up to you to continue. So what I do in my business is we have quarterly planning. So the way we do it is we start with a 10-year vision. We have five-year milestones. And then we have our one-year targets. That's just giving us direction of where we want to get to. And then we focus on the next 90 days. What are the actions we need to take in the next 90 days to hit certain results? By the end of 90 days, we do a quarterly meeting and we ask ourselves, what we were doing, was it effective? Do we need to change it or do we need to continue doing it? Do we need to change anything now, right? This one-year target that we set for ourselves, was it a little beyond our capacity or can we actually achieve it very, very quickly, and we need to now increase it, right? So those five, 10, and one-year targets are there just to give us some sort of direction. But then the 30, 60, 90, these are the actual action steps you're going to be taking to build your business. So going back to building the masjid, you may say, uh, I want to complete building the masjid in one year. And you build out this plan that, you know, in the, in the, in the next 90 days, you're going to finish uh, one quarter of building the mustard. And then you boil it down. 30, day, 30 days, what are you going to do? You're going to lay down this particular foundation. Uh, how do you do it on a daily basis? Daily basis, we're going to start working from eight all the way to five, right? That's our construction time. And you start building. And you realize after 90 days, when you go back and you reassess your quarterly plan and you plan for the next quarter, you come back and you say, uh, either you say it may not be possible to make it within the next 90 days. Why? Because there's, you know, uh, we realized that while we were digging, there is a pipe that needs to be changed. So now that's some sort of problem that we ran into. Or you may realize that, hey, we set a one-year target but we are halfway done already, right? So that so these are just different examples of how all this kind of comes into play, all right? Um, okay, now we're just kind of elaborating on this process over here. Uh, setting goals will help you determine where you want to get to, where you want to go, but figuring out the process and the action needed will help you figure out the how. Both are important. Right. So, for example, uh, let's look at this over here. Uh, focus on your body weight. The result goal is that you want to lose 15 pounds. 
but what's the process that's going to help you get there? The process is how many days can I go without sugar, right? Uh, your result goal may be to build more muscle. What's the process goal? How many workouts am I getting done weekly, right? Better marriage and better parent. What's the process for that? How much time, how much quality time am I spending with my family? Uh, growing your business. That's the result goal. What's the process? How many books am I reading? Uh, or uh, how many books am I reading to grow my knowledge on that particular business, right? So you start getting the idea of goals versus processes. You have to have both. You can't start a process if you don't have a target in place. And if you just have a target in place, a result in place, but you don't focus on the process to get you there, you're never going to get there, right? Just writing down or just saying to yourself, you know, by the end of the year, uh, I want to lose 10 pounds. That's not going to help you lose 10 pounds. You need to now think about what do, what do I need to do on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, the process to get me that result, right? And the reason why uh, I like to do 90 days instead of one year is 90 days will allow you to test something long enough to see if it works or if it doesn't work. And it brings the deadline shorter. So now instead of having to wait one year, 12 months, there's more urgency, right? If you say to yourself, you know, I want to lose 10 pounds in one year, guaranteed you're going to say, I have a lot of time left. So maybe I'll start in November, right? Uh, but then when you say to yourself, I want to lose two pounds in the next 90 days. It's much shorter and um, there's much more urgency and it's much closer so you can take steps, right? So that's the psychology be behind one-year goals versus 90-day goals. 90 days is like, what, three months, right? So that's all we're going to cover for today, inshallah. Um, and we will continue on uh, tomorrow. I mean, so not tomorrow, next week on how to actually measure and track our progress. So now we know uh, where to start, how to start, what we need to start doing. So now we need to make sure that we stay on the path, right? That we stay on the path of progress. So that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna cover next week, inshallah. Um, how do we continuously track that we're doing the right thing and uh, we're getting closer and closer to our goals, right? Um, any questions? For process goals, is that more like like tangible steps or tangible yeah. Yeah. actions you can take that like indicate, okay, I'm moving towards this goal. Exactly. exactly yep. okay. So, so let's, let's say your goal, goal is to lose 30 pounds by 30 pounds is too much. Oh, well, it depends on your weight. Let, let's say your goal is to lose. No, let's say your goal is to build uh, uh, 10 pounds in the next 90 days. So what do we do? We say on a weekly, ba on a daily basis, I need to eat four meals and get in 200 grams of protein. On a, that's on a daily basis. On a weekly basis, I need to work out five days a week. I mean, five days a week. On a monthly basis, um, I need to, you know, on a monthly basis, I need to check my one rep max, meaning what's the most amount of weight I can lift one time. Yeah. So now you have a process goal, which is actual tangible action steps. So you start doing this for the next 90 days. And after 90 days, you realize that it took you 90 days following this process to build five pounds of muscle, but your initial goal was 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. So now you have to ask yourself, did I just kind of set a very unrealistic goal or is my process incorrect? Can I make my process a little bit better? 
So then you get into research and development. Maybe I need to speak to a coach and see if I can tweak my workout or if my entire thing was messed up, you know, my initial goal. Maybe five pounds of muscle in three months is actually very, very good. And 10 pounds was because I saw the rock and I didn't realize or factor in that he takes steroids, right? Uh, so that's how you kind of track your progress. And that's why 90 days is much better than waiting one year, right? Um, it, you get results much quicker and faster. All right. Uh, any other questions? No? All right, then, inshallah. So we can finish up. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, uh, Brother Sohal is going to uh, create the WhatsApp group. So if you have any questions in there, you can always ask us in there. Yeah, so brothers, sisters, I have some of the you know participants. I have their contact number. So I will make a group uh, chat so that we will post the recording and also any updates. And also as a reminder, we will use the same link. So please use the same link. But inshallah, I will post the link also in the group chat. So, uh, but please send me um, your contact information, your uh, phone number and the name so that I will create a group. This way we will uh, chat and uh, and update anything. In, in case if there's a cancellation of class, inshallah, we'll post that also in the same group. This way everyone will be uh, updated. Um, so Jazakallah khair. Inshallah, we'll start on the same time, like nine o'clock, nine to ten, and just you know, we will give five minutes, you know, in case of somebody's late, but try to be on time um, so that people can leave on time also because it's Saturday and people have to run errands and do other stuff. Okay, Jazakallah khair for participation.